Back to the top of the Premier League table go Arsenal after a very impressive victory on the South Coast. Meanwhile, Arsenal become unanimous with Manchester United in the hope that they might stay there come the end of Sunday. This is the Arsenal Raw Reaction Show. Hello and welcome to the Guna Talk. Back again with you guys for another episode of what is the Arsenal Raw Reaction Show. Joining you the morning after Arsenal's impressive win. Yet another impressive away victory. Yet another impressive away clean sheet. What a season Arsenal are happy, having this season. It is quite incredible what Arsenal are doing continually, consistently. And they are putting in the fear to their opponents, especially ahead of what is an important week for the Arsenal. Um, but uh, moving to European action, we'll talk about that probably in part two. But in part one, we're going to talk all about Arsenal 3, Brighton and Hove Albion nil. Going into the chat box, good morning to those of you joining us. Thank you so much, as always, for doing so. I'd also like to thank the Japanese Grand Prix for finishing just as the show starts as well. Uh, Carl, good morning to you, to Leopold, to Jackie, Steve. We've got Carlton, AB, Rich. We've got Kaiser, Arasilki, Brad, Mark, The Process, Ryan, Matt G, Stephen, King 10. Uh, we've got Glenn and Graham, Jalali, uh, Jacob. We've got Shari and A1, Granddaddy, Guna, Paul. We've got Mark. We've got Paul, another Paul. Lots of Pauls in the chat today. Angela, we've got Stevie and Jose. We've got Temi. Thank you, uh, Vivian, GZ4, Popeye. Thank you to all of you and more for tuning in. It is incredibly appreciated. Uh, I hope that you have uh, a fantastic weekend and have had a good Saturday and that you can have now a relaxing, chill Sunday, which will include no stress whatsoever because Manchester United are a historically great club who never lose games, never embarrass themselves, and will comfortably beat Liverpool later on this afternoon. Um, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, we're going to start the show uh, with, as always, going through the highlights of yesterday's game and yesterday's win. A very impressive victory to put the pressure on Liverpool. Arsenal, of course, had the pressure put on them as they dropped down to third place in the table when Manchester City beat Crystal Palace despite going a goal behind. I have to say, I think personally, Crystal Palace were exceptionally hard done by and should certainly have won a penalty um, when Mateta was fouled by Gvardiol just before the halftime break. For me, that was a penalty all day long and I have no idea how they managed to get away with it not being given. But that is the reality, um, sadly, of, of yesterday. And uh, despite the fact that Man City came away with that win, Arsenal responded. And uh, and that was a very impressive response, what we ultimately saw. Uh, we started the game very dominant, but still somewhat open. There were chances and opportunities for Brighton to attack. And Arsenal created still plenty. By half-time, they'd had nine shots on um, or at the uh, at the Brighton goal, a few of those hitting the target. Verbruggen having a very good first half. There was good chances for Saka as he opened himself up on the right hand side, missed a shot wide of the goal. Um, we had a header in the opening minutes from Gabriel that should have been scored that went wide as well. Jesus had an opportunity to strike as well. Good save from Verbruggen on the right-hand side. He also had a header that he, should, he certainly should have done better with. Kai Havertz getting in and tapping um, kind of a loose ball just beyond the goal um, that sadly couldn't be taken advantage of either. Uh, and David Raya pulled off a big, big save in the first half as well from Enciso, um, which we'll talk about when we talk more specifically about Raya. But Arsenal did take the lead before the half, where Gabriel Jesus managed to get a penalty off the back of Tarek Lamptey. A potentially controversial decision. Uh, it was given by the referee on field, which perhaps is why indeed the VAR did not overturn it. I think it's one of those where if the referee doesn't give it, then I'm not sure VAR would give it because Lamptey does get a slight touch on the ball. Now, just because you get a touch on the ball, of course, doesn't mean that it's not still a foul. It's important to point that out. Um, you can still, of course, uh, foul your opponent, despite the fact that uh, you may get a touch on the ball. And he certainly impeded Gabriel Jesus from reaching the ball, despite getting that slight touch on him. I, th I think from my perspective, 
in this day and age of football, it's a penalty all day. Um, but I can understand why some people will perhaps be raising some questions. But if you're not going to give the one that Palace didn't get, I think uh, T. Schwantz, uh, Stasty corrects me here, says it was uh, Eze, supposedly not Mateta, that was fouled. Um, which is weird, because I swear at half-time, I remember them saying in commentary that it was Mateta. But um, it was Mateta who opened the scoring, of course, in the, in the game rather than, than Eze. Yes, Eze, arguably fouled by Gvardio. Um, but for me, in this day and age, you're always going to get the penalty given. And then Saka has to step up and do the business which he absolutely did. Fantastic finish, fantastic composure uh, from Saka to take the penalty and to slot it past Verbruggen on that left-hand side. Very cool, calm and collected from the Arsenal winger. Now, the second half kicked off very much like the first with opportunities for both sides. And it wasn't until the 64th to 67th, I think, minute in that period where Arsenal managed to get that key important goal. Kai Havertz getting on the end of a fantastic move from Arsenal. Despite the fact that Saka was actually down injured during this period, we saw Kai Havertz get into the right position at the right time. Jorginho getting in behind for the cross. Chelsea boys combining uh, to give Arsenal an important goal and one which gave them control of the game. Very positive indeed. Um, but Mikel Arteta will be pleased that the monster that he has created in Kai Havertz continues to be very, very impressive indeed. He just continues to score, continues to, with great movement. I thought his defensive contribution yesterday was excellent. His running, his pressing was so strong throughout the game. And we just can't be disappointed with what we've seen um, from Kai Havertz. It's been absolutely excellent. Um, and we have to congratulate Havertz on the work that he has put in, on the work that's been put in on the training ground as well. All of these things have combined, I think, for a very, very impressive um, kind of run of form for, of course, but for the entirety of the Arsenal team with with him at the centre forward position. And he will go into that game against Bayern Munich on Tuesday as Arsenal's starting striker. And if you'd have asked me at the start of the season, or perhaps after a couple of months of the season, whether I thought Kai Havertz would indeed be Arsenal's starting striker, I think I probably said that you were mad. Um, and just an update on the uh, the charity bet that myself and Dan Potts had at the start of the season. Kai Havertz currently leads James Madison in Premier League goal contributions by three at this point. The loser of this bet will be donating £100 to charity of the winner's choice. Um, and at the moment, I'm very happy to say that uh, Kai Havertz is winning me that bet right now, despite the fact that at the start of the season, it very much seemed like that wasn't going to be the case. But uh, yes, very good indeed from Havertz. But are you not entertained is the question that Leandro Trossard has for you. Because again, Havertz involved in the build-up. Lovely touch and flick through to set Leandro Trossard through on goal. Brilliant composed finish. I have said this time and time again. For me, Leandro Trossard is the best finisher at Arsenal Football Club. He is the most composed finisher at the club. And if you get him into those positions, he is very deadly indeed. And that's what makes him such a valuable asset to this club. Like we saw against Porto, like we saw against West Ham, like we've seen time and time before at Chelsea, he scores important goals and tough finishes in tough moments. You know, I know this was to take all of the pressure off and we were already leading by two goals, but to get that third was key. And Trossard's pace being on display as well, he's never really been talked about as a pacey winger, but his speed was certainly on display as he controlled the ball excellently, the lovely first touch, just far enough in front of him that he can run onto it, not far enough that Verbruggen can come out and collect it Really good stuff from Trossard and uh, a celebration to match. The Brighton fans, all they've done is boo him every single time he plays against them. So he's more than entitled to celebrate and uh, a brilliant, brilliant finish to cap off a unbelievably good champion-like performance from Arsenal on the day. But there are some honourable mentions that we need to talk about from the fixture as well. Is there an argument that Gabriel Magalhaes is Arsenal's player of the season so far? Because we talk about how good Declan Rice is. We've talked about the goal contributions of Bakai Saka. We talk about the leadership shown by Martin Odegaard. We've talked about William Saliba being as good as he always is. We've talked about Ben White having a fantastic campaign as well. We've talked about players like, you know, um, Havertz as well, of course, being very impressive. But is Gabriel Magalhaes potentially Arsenal's player of the season? He has been stunningly good. There was a moment at the end of the game, if you've not managed to watch it, if you managed to only watch the highlights of yesterday, you may have missed this. But at the end of the game, there was a shot in the final moments. I think it was Raul Pedro with the strike. Gabriel gets a leg in to block this and celebrates it like he scored a 30-yard screamer. 
And all the players around him, Trossard in particular, running up to him, celebrating, screaming in his face, just with absolute ecstasy that Arsenal have managed to block that shot and keep that and maintain that clean sheet. He has been so good for us. He should have scored a couple of goals yesterday from, from corners. He's been so threatening in the box as well. There was a moment where he went down as well with what looked to be a bit of a foot issue. And, you know, he has been suffering with something of a foot problem. So hopefully that's nothing too serious. He did complete the game, which obviously is very good. But my goodness me, Gabriel Magalhaes has put to bed and put in the mud those critics. I love bringing up the article that I wrote back in 2022 because I'm sorry, but there are people out there that really wanted to scapegoat this guy. There are people out there that wanted to muddy this guy's name. There are people out there that wanted him replaced, that called him a bozo, that said he had this bozo gene that kind of went through the fan base. It's a horrible description, disgusting treatment of your own player. And he has absolutely muddied these fools absolutely muddied them. Brilliant performance, excellent consistency, and he's a big part of why Arsenal are huge title challenges this season. Now, we have to also talk about David Rea, who I believe, I think I saw a tweet yesterday, no matter what happens, has potentially won the Golden Glove already. I, I need to get that double-checked. Maybe someone in the chat box can double-check that for me. But I thought I saw a tweet saying that David Rea has, has already won the Golden Glove, which, if it's true, which there's still not eight games to go, so surely that, that would be quite the task, if it is indeed true. But what there is a stat that is certainly real is that Arsenal have now kept more clean sheets in their last five Premier League away games than any other side has kept in any away game or in a, uh, in a run of away games all season. Amazing stuff. Um, David Raya has also kept clean sheets, I think, in his last five consecutive Premier League away games. The save he pulled off yesterday was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And for me, when we talk about the signings that Arteta has made, when we talk about the question marks that we've had uh, over um, uh, kind of Havertz and Raya and some of the signings that he's made, they have absolutely justified their selection. They've justified the faith that the club has paid in them. And that's really important. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward. Uh, Mars Cannon says he has it in the bag. Maybe it's a case of, like, we're just expecting him to win it at this stage. Maybe I don't know if he's, he's guaranteed to win it yet um, in terms of the Golden Glove. But uh, he's certainly at them. Bear in mind that he's not played two games in the league this season when we played Brentford. No, Rams, they managed to keep a clean sheet at Brentford earlier in the season. And then obviously we won 2-1 in the second game. But he was obviously denied those two games to be able to play those fixtures as well. So he's played two games less than what a lot of other goalkeepers typically tend to play if they manage to stay fit throughout the course of the season. Unless Allison and Edison haven't been able to do that yet this season, of course, either. So that might be playing into it. But a huge achievement. And again, another really important piece of business by Arsenal. I would say it's distribution again. At times, there was a couple of misplayed passes. But there was some very good passes as well, which should really be highlighted, I think, more so than the ones that went a little bit astray. So he's still getting better. He's still improving that distribution. And that certainly needs to be talked about. OK, that was a lot of positivity. So it's time to balance things out. I have a very small complaint. Very, very small. OK, so don't bite my head off because I've been very, very optimistic and positive here. But I think, we're, you know, it's always important to look at both sides of the coin. I have a very, 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 very slight complaint. We did not need to play Declan Rice for the entire game. That, that's it. That's all I've got. <laughs> but we, we didn't need to play Declan Rice for the entire game. We got Bayern Munich in midweek. I know Rice got a rest against Luton. I know that. But you've got Partey on the bench. You've got Smith Rowe on the bench. You've got you know players that could come off the bench potentially and change position. You could move Zinni in there if you wanted to. You know, There's options. I think we could have brought Rice off. And all I could think as we were closing the game out, even at two up, let alone three up, all I could think about was Rice is going to be knackered. Rice has been running his socks off all game. And we didn't bring Odegaard and uh, Havertz off until like the 87th minute or something like that either. I just feel as I, I think Arteta's rotation has been really good. Five changes from the City game into Luton, four changes from the Luton game into this one. Really improved that. Absolutely improved it, without doubt. His rotation is definitely something that is getting better. And the, the aspects of his game at the start of the season that we wanted to see improve, we wanted to see his game-by-game -game improvement as a manager. And we wanted to see his in-game management improve. And they've both come on drastically. But we've always still got to look at where we can improve. That's what makes the best the best, is by looking at what you can do better, looking how you can get better. And I would just 
politely, respectfully ask Arteta, please <laughs> don't run the players into the ground if we don't need to. And I just felt as though, yeah, take Rice off if you can. And I felt we could have taken Rice off, especially with Partey on the bench. Um, I think that was important because there's, you know, games this season, like we think about we were 5-0 up against Sheffield United at half time. The only change we made at half time in that game was Saka, and that's because he wasn't well. And then when the next change we made in that Sheffield United game didn't come until the 64th minute, and that was Martinelli coming off because he was injured. And it was needless at 5 0 up to keep those players on. We could have made two or three changes at half time at 3 0, bring some players off, give them important rest, protect them, especially because we had, you know, Bradford and then Porto coming up. Why did we risk Martinelli? Now it's easy to say with the benefit of hindsight now, oh, look, you're only saying that because Martinelli got injured. But I think there is something to be said about that. And I think that's a fair comment to make. Um, so, yeah, let's let's see what happens. But I, I just cautiously would like to raise that point. Arteta in his press conference after the game, though, was very, very happy, as uh, as we would expect. Uh, Arteta, of course, conducting his post-match press conference. He says, I'm really happy, really proud of the boys. The, uh, the, uh, they put in a big performance to beat this great Brighton side. They haven't lost here since August. And that tells you the difficulty of the task. Um, but we were really good today. Talking about Saka and the small margins um, about when he took the penalty to give us the lead, he says there's a little one or a huge one because the penalty is a goal and the different scoreline makes a whole difference. But just the, ca the courage to take it again because I'm sure something was around his mind, but it's another year. He has gone through that missing against West Ham and he wants to make a difference. And this narrative, I hope, is kind of put to bed at this point. You know, Saka has stepped up to take some important penalties for Arsenal. He stepped to take the penalty up against West Ham, remember? Um, was it not the penalty? Did it give us either? He gave us the lead or it gave us a 2 0 advantage against West Ham, that penalty. And he stepped up again in a really big moment to take a penalty against Brighton now, and he scored it. I really hope this puts to bed the whole penalty narrative that surrounds Bukaya Saka because I don't think it needs to continue at this stage. He was asked about Ben White and he said, credit to him. He's always willing to learn, to train, to play in any circumstances. And when he's feeling good, when he's not feeling that good, he's open-minded and he has the desire to win. And that's what he made the difference in. Asking about celebrating Gabriel's block, as I mentioned earlier, he says that's really pleasing for all the coaches to see that reaction from the team at 3-0. It's great because that tells you how much they want it. The importance and the focus they put in every single ball. And that was an extra bonus today. He was asked about Havertz and the difference of player that he is since the start of the season. He says, yeah, obviously he's in a different moment. He's got some fantastic players around him, which I love is maybe a slight dig at Chelsea unintentionally. Uh, we have tried to create the right environment for him, which I think is very important for any player. We have given him confidence. I think hopefully we've given the love that he needs. And after, he has the appreciation from the rest of the players and the staff at the club now, our supporters for sure. And I think it's a really important point. The, the environment around Havertz, the environment around every player that we sign gives them the platform to succeed. They have a great coach. They have great coaches. They have great teammates. They have great fans on the whole that support them hugely and they have a great environment to be able to, you know, hopefully at least uh, fulfill their, uh, their potential. Now, the Premier League, of course, did uh, have a number of games yesterday. I've already mentioned that Manchester City victory over Crystal Palace. They won 4-2. Unai Emery with a classic run-in slip-up against Brentford, a 3-3 draw at home against relegation thre uh, threatened Brentford. Everton secured a very important victory, a 1-0 win over Burnley. Newcastle getting an important away, tricky win at Fulham, but they got it with a 1-0. Luton Town, what a result for them. 2-1 over Bournemouth in their game. Bournemouth took the lead. Luton Town coming from behind with two late goals. Really credit to Rob Edwards and his side. I think everyone's kind of championing Luton to hopefully stay up next season. West Ham, again, another really important victory on the road. Perhaps something of an encouragement that Wolves are very much gettable in their own ground. And then Arsenal, of course, playing Brighton and winning 3-0, as we've discussed. Today's games are big ones. Uh, we've got Manchester United against Liverpool. We're all going to adorn ourselves with... No, we're not. We're not going to go that far. We're just going to hope that Liverpool drop points um, and hope Manchester United can stop embarrassing themselves for a minute and that Mikel, Mikel Arter, and Eric Ten Hag can finally take some accountability and maybe use what he described as an angry and mad Manchester United going into that game and hopefully can get a result. Sheffield United played Chelsea at half five and the last kick of the day is Spurs against Nottingham Forest. Let's hope that Nottingham Forest can set Spurs straight in another game as well. Last point, just before we go to part two, is on Bayern Munich. Of course, Arsenal play Bayern on Tuesday evening. Very much looking forward to this game and attending at the Champions League Emirates quarterfinal. Not something we've seen since 20. 
10. Well, Bayern Munich took a 2-0 lead in their game against Heidenheim before they then conceded three goals in the second half. They went very strong. All the usual suspects were involved. Kane, Gnabry, uh, Jamal Musiala, Kimmich, Goretzka, uh, Kim Min Jae, Upper Meccano. Um, all the usuals were involved and a very strong side. Didn't rest anyone except Derek Dyer. So there's that to be worried about for Tuesday. Um, but uh, yes, losing 3-2. And what that means is, is that between the two Arsenal games, Bayern Munich can lose the title. If Bayer Leverkusen win next weekend, they'll be nine, or they will go to 79 points, which will be more than there is able to catch up for Bayern. So Bayer Leverkusen, Granit Xhaka can win the Bundesliga title next weekend in their next Bundesliga game, should they win. They can still, of course, go unbeaten in the league as well. And it is really set up by Munich to experience a very difficult period as a club. Now, their director, uh, Eberl, who you may have heard of, uh, he was asked about the search for a new coach after the game against Heidenheim. And he says, I don't give a... Sh you can fill in the gap there. About the search for a coach. Now it's all about the Arsenal game. We'll face a team that, with all respect to Heidenheim, is a class above them. We have to make a proper turnaround so that we don't get a slap to the face. Well, I certainly hope that Arsenal do give Bayern a figurative slap to the face, footballistically speaking, of course, and absolutely batter them. And revenge and avenge are defeats of the last fair few years. One of their directors came out recently saying about how simple it has basically been beating Arsenal in recent seasons, but that it is a different beast now, and it certainly is. Now, if you want a different beast protecting your internet safety and security, you need NordVPN. NordVPN has been sponsoring us over the last month and we're very grateful for them for doing that. So please do go and get involved with the latest offer and the final offer for a little while, uh, which is a extra three months off a one-year deal thrown in free. You can get a discount off that as well by using the code TGT. Um, sorry, by using the code GUNA. If you go to nordvpn.com slash GUNA, you can get yourself that discount off a one-year deal. And not only that, but you can get the same and if not more, discount off a two-year deal as well with four months extra thrown in free as well. It gives you the ability to change geolocation on your phone, your tablet, or indeed your laptop, whichever digital device you would like to use to hop back around the world. Maybe you're wanting to watch the Arsenal Bayern Munich highlights on Tuesday on the TNT YouTube channel, for instance, but you're in a country that won't let you do that. Well, while using NordVPN, you can hop over to the UK and watch them without a problem. So I recommend you go down to the link in the description. And for the final time for a little while, please do go and get that deal. Massive thank you again to NordVPN for sponsoring the channel. Right, let's go to part two right after this. Okay then, part so, your questions, your focus, you coming into the forefront of the show. If you've got a question that you'd like to ask, please drop it into the chat box and I will do my absolute best to answer it for you. Please, if you haven't done so already, though, drop a like on the video. Help us to 1K every single day it is our daily challenge here at the channel. If you are new, we try and reach a thousand likes on every single show as we push towards the run in of this title race. Maybe we'll go on longer. Maybe we'll go throughout the summer window. Maybe we'll go forever. We will wait and see. There were so many jokes running around my head then that I opted not to use because it's a family show. Jumping to our chat box, though, uh, Bermuda Guna uh, says, ESPN Stevie Nickel said that he doesn't give Arteta credit for Havertz' good form. It's poor punditry. Uh, well, if Sophie has Stevie Nickel on her show, which I believe she has done a couple of times, maybe she can ask him about that because, quite frankly, that is a silly take. <laughs> a very silly take. Yep, nothing to do with Arteta. Player comes from a club, hasn't been playing very well, moves to another club, plays very well. Nothing to do with the manager, nothing at all. It's almost like these people didn't actually play football before. Uh, Ashley says, do you think Jesus is um, Yoga Benito? Too much instead of nine times uh, skilling. I don't know what that even means, Ashley, to be honest. Um, skilling and taking on players rather than layoffs and make runs into space like Kai. Lose focus and accuracy of the pass focus and too much on skill. Uh, to be honest, I think that that skill is what gave us the lead, Ashley. You have to, have to remember, you know, it was him taking on Lamptey, which earned us that penalty, which opened the scoring for us. I absolutely understand that sometimes he can overdo it and he can take too many touches. But actually, I think Arsenal are lacking in those types of players. And sometimes we need that element in a team just to give you something a bit different, give you a different dynamic. And I think he's taken to those wide positions really well. And you have to point out that those skills, you know, those attempts to take players on is what won us the penalty 
which helped us take the lead in this game. So it is worth pointing that out. Um, uh, Jonas says, Tom, do you miss Javinho? Oh, every day, every, every single day. Uh, Levin 8 says, morning, Tom. Is Douglas Luiz suspended for the Aston Villa game next week? Oh, that's an interesting question. Shall we have a look? Uh, Douglas Luiz, let's have a quick look. How many yellow cards has he got? Uh, he has got 10 yellow cards. Did he get booked yesterday? He did. Yes, he will be suspended for the game against Arsenal. 10 yellow cards for Douglas Luiz. Big blow to Villa as they come to play at the Emirates. Uh, oh, by the way, Kai Havertz, the only way that he can now get suspended is if he gets two yellow cards against um, Aston Villa next week. Of course, he's on eight. Um, so if he was to get two yellows, he would get a red, but he would get a one-match suspension for the red and two games on top of that. So three overall for reaching 10 yellow cards. Uh, Mike says, hey, come on. Uh, that wasn't Nichols quite context. You get grumpy if someone misquotes yourself. We all need to be careful. Mike, I am more than happy to be corrected if we have indeed from one of our super, super chats been uh, taken out of context. Mike, please do tell me the full context. I can only read what I see on here. So if you're more than willing to come in and tell me the full context, please do. And I'll happily retract those comments. Uh, Rob Bob says, if Kai continues as he is for the rest of the season, does the big striker signing narrative need to be re-examined? Yes, certainly. Um, I think that there's an argument that Arsenal don't, desperately need something of like a, a, a tall target man doesn't mean that we shouldn't still go out and get say a Jokerez type signing or a Schick or a Sesco etc you know I still think that there is scope for Arsenal to go out and add a centre forward in the summer that really adds something to this team like a Jokerez for example um, but Havertz has absolutely changed the entire view of what he said um, Late Bloomer says, Nichols said that Arteta bought him as a midfielder and not a striker, so he can't get credit for what Kai is doing. I mean, if that is what he said, I mean, let me see if I can see, see if I can find the quote, shall I? Have a, Arteta. Surely I'll be able to find the quotes somewhere. Um, and then I'll read them in full. And that means we'll get the best context as opposed to taking them out of context. Uh, news. Uh, no, that doesn't seem to be it. Uh, no, nope, that's from six months ago. Doesn't seem that there is anything. Um, or no one's written up the quotes, at least. Not that I've said, and not that I've seen whatsoever. So, at the moment, if anyone can find the exact quotes, then I'll have a read of them, but I haven't seen it. Um, Gage says, why was Lee Dixon so against the penalty call yesterday? He sounded like a Spurs fan. I mean, Gage, you probably just thought because he's a defender, if he gets a foot on the ball, it shouldn't be a penalty. So that's that's probably the reason why. Um, I don't think that's too out there. You know, as a suggestion, I think if you're a defender, especially an old school defender, and you get a touch on the ball, you will feel as though it shouldn't be a penalty. And so I think that's probably why. Uh, Lee says, hey, Tom, all remaining games are all important, but the Spurs fixture stands out as a North London derby. Could always be a bit of a banana skin. Of course it could. Um, but Arsenal going to every single game, I believe, as a team that can win every single game that they play. So let's wait and see what happens. Um, Manchester United have got to do Arsenal a big, big favour today. And we keep our fingers crossed that they can. We really, really hope that they do. Uh, Rebo says, Tom, comment about Zinni's performance yesterday. I felt it was below par. Zinchenko is getting way too much scrutiny at the moment. Way too much scrutiny. By the way, Zinchenko started against Brighton at home. He started against Brighton away. And we've won those games with clean sheets. And he has been a big part of the reason why the build-up in those games has been as good as it was. I'm getting a little bit tired of Zinchenko becoming the scapegoat. This isn't an attack on you, Uribe, by the way. I, I, plenty of people have been trying to bring up Zinchenko as, as a desperate need to criticise something. And I know that I brought up my own criticism in the first half, but it was more of a, a constructive thing. Zinchenko's build-up is really important. It's not always so obvious. It's not always so glaring. But what he does sometimes is subtle and really key to the way in which we build up those games. He started both matches against a Brighton side that we tend to always do poorly against, and we've managed to win five goals across those two games. It wasn't on for all of those, but I'm getting really quite sick and tired of Zinchenko becoming a bit of a scapegoat at the moment. We always have to blame somebody. We always have to target someone, and Zinchenko, I feel, is starting to get that. He's important to what we do. He's a quality player, and he's a really good passer. Is he perfect? No. Does he make mistakes? Yes. Does he give the ball away in silly situations sometimes? Absolutely, yes, he does. But 
it's offset by the really good things that he does, which people just don't seem to want to talk about these days. It's like we've become so numbed to it. We've become really numbed to some of the things that he does in a positive way. He and Jesus as signings are two of the, are two of the most important signings this club has ever made. Period. And two of those players are a huge part of the progression that we've made to the team that we are today, challenging for these these positions. You know, he started five goals in the last two games he started. Would I start him against Bayern Munich? No, I think there is a, a Kivior to start in this game. I think we should be a little bit more reserved maybe. And I think maybe that would be a bit naive. But in these games where Arsenal are going to have more dominance against a team which you know don't necessarily have the attacking quality of Bayern Munich, I think that he's a really good option for us to help suffocate teams, to help, you know, build up that confidence going forwards and to help in uh, recycling the ball if we need to. By the way, I haven't mentioned something which I am really frustrated didn't end in a goal, but there was a moment in the first half where Saliba is in his own near the six-yard box, takes a couple of touches around Brighton players with the ball, which makes your heart absolutely go. He then plays a little one-two. I think it's with White. There's then a little chip where there is then, I think, I think it might be Jorginho, does a backwards header out of the box and Arsenal counter. It was one of the best moves from a team in their own box to escape a press I have ever seen in my entire footballing watching life. It was one of the best movements. I wish I could get a clip of it and rewatch it again. If anyone has it, please send it my way. And I'm so gutted that it didn't end. I think it ended with Havertz crossing and uh, the cross being cut out in the end. But what a move. Um, amazing stuff. Absolutely brilliant. Um, Saliba's composure just continues to astonish us and uh, having him available for the run-in is uh, something that we didn't have last season and definitely is a big reason why we didn't win the league last season. Without Saliba, things really did fall apart for us, quite sadly. Um, Mike says, agreed reason Chenko scapegoating. Even if there are doubts and mistakes, he is quality and he gives other squad players to get... Um, he, he gives our other squad players um, and makes them better. But we should start Tommy against Bayern, says Mike. Uh, I mean, I'm happy with Tommy or Kivio. Kivio, I think, deserves to start. Kivio has started a clean sheet against City. He came on at halftime against Liverpool at 1-1. We won 3-1. Kivio, I think, absolutely would be fine to start against Bayern Munich. I would back him to start against Serge Gnabry. The guy's got quality. The guy's got loads of potential. And he's got existing foundational quality as well, which I really am buying into. Um absolutely uh, give your or Tommy I'd be more than happy to see start on, on Tuesday night uh, Gage says Tom what did you make of Trossard celebration surely it seemed a bit personal fair play to the guy he's been booed non-stop by um, Brighton fans he, he, he's earned that moment he's absolutely earned that moment fair play to him uh, CJ Dan says I don't think it's scapegoating fans always think teams can get better with certain adjustments CJ Dan it is scapegoating when it's targeted and it ignores the positives that is exactly, by definition, it's scapegoating because you're ignoring the positive side of things and targeting. And I'm not talking about everybody, by the way. This is some people. So you can't say, I don't think it's scapegoating because there are some people that definitely, definitely are scapegoating Zinchenko. That no matter what happens in the game, no matter what good things he does, there are still criticisms. There are still skewed to the negative towards him. It's absolutely scapegoating by definition beyond all measure is what it is. Uh, Justin, thank you so much for the kind donation. Uh, Leno, Anana and Pickford are tied second on eight clean sheets each. So Raya is close to winning the Golden Glove. It's not guaranteed yet. Anana might pull a fast one on Raya. <laughs> I hope he keeps a clean sheet today. I'm praying, absolutely praying for a, uh, an Anana clean sheet today. And Vegas says, I think Zinchenko would be a good eight for us. I'm puzzled as to why he hasn't been tried in that position. But for us, maybe Timber uh, comes back and, and takes that position. Look, Timber absolutely should be coming into the team when possible and, and eventually probably taking a spot on the left-hand side. Stunningly good footballer. Um, I think that what we've got to do is... And I don't, I don't agree with the whole Zinchenko in midfield. Uh, as like a, as a thing going forwards. Zinchenko is a left back and is a certain type of left back. And that's the, the player that Arteta has cultivated at Arsenal. I don't think there's ever going to really be a place for Zinchenko in the Arsenal midfield. Um, I, I just don't see it. I, I don't, I don't, I just personally don't see it. I don't see Zinchenko doing that role. Um, I think the role that he plays now is so specialized and it, it's kind of done in combination with the existing midfielders that we have that I'm not sure I see it. I think if Zinchenko is eventually replaced, he will eventually move on. 
I think if eventually Timber comes into that position and, and makes it his own, I think Zinchenko will eventually move on. I think he'll still be here next season. And I'm absolutely fine with Zinchenko being here next season. He's a, he's a really, really good footballer. Um, I'm more than happy to see how. Um, Dickens says, hey, Tom, any thoughts on why Arteta isn't considering a Partey Rice midfield? Because Partey's only just come back. Jorginho's doing really, really well. And we don't need to. But we, we probably will see that midfield combination before the end of the season. Um, I'm almost certain that we will see it before the end of the season. Uh, Galactic says, hi, Tom. Um, what would be the ideal front line against Bayern? I would rather see Nelly and Saka. Yeah, I agree. I think Martinelli, Havertz and Saka would be my starting front three on Tuesday. Uh, that's what I would go with. Aribi says, is Timber actually a left back or a right back? That's a question that doesn't need an answer, mate, because he can be either. Uh, Dickens says, hey, so any... Oh, sorry, we've done that one. Uh, Paul says, Man United's goal difference is minus one. I'm not I'm not trying on a nana today, are you? Oh, yeah, absolutely, Paul. You've got to have faith. You've got to believe. Nothing happens if you don't believe. So we've got to believe in a nana that he's going to pull off the unthinkable and keep a clean sheet against Liverpool. By the way, Liverpool's shooting, you know, is an interesting fact. They're like 10th, I think, in the league or around 10th place for shot conversion. They have a lot of shots. The shot accuracy is not always the best. So if you can limit the amount of shots Liverpool have, it tends to, it, that tends to be what stops them from being effective. So any team should be looking at that and just thinking, we need to stop Liverpool shooting. And that's the best way we're going to have of getting anything against them. It's not exactly easy, but that is what you need to do to beat Liverpool because their shot conversion ranking isn't great. I mean, for a team that are top of the table and could win the league, it's very poor. They just have so many shots um, that in the end, eventually they go in. They just need to be stopped from shooting. Um, my says, I will shamelessly adorn what I need to to see Manchester United get something later and shamelessly so if it helps. I do promise to take a long shower afterwards. So, Mike, you do what you got to do, mate. You do got you do what you got to do. <laughs> it's fair enough. Uh, Ashmel says rival fans slandering Havertz for his goal contributions is funny. If he was Arsenal's penalty taker, he would have been golden boot contender by now, and we wouldn't be hearing those awful takes from rivals. I don't know if he'd be golden boot contender. I don't know how many penalties. I think we've had loads. I think we've had five or six maybe penalties this season. Um, if rival fans are still criticising Havertz, it's because they're too proud to admit that they're wrong. It's as simple as that, as are still some Arsenal fans, of course, too. Um, Akash says, Tom, we should buy Kimmich and play him at six, Rice at eight, and Eric uh, Martel for backup. He has a huge future. I don't know much about him, but Kimmich uh, is absolutely a signing I'd love to see Arsenal do in the summer, without without doubt. Uh, MA says, hey, Tom, uh, you're looking to see Fabio Vieira play. He was playing well at the beginning of the season. I don't know when. I guess we could have brought him on sooner for Rice yesterday. I probably would have done that. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's it's just difficult to know when you can play him with the minutes, the games that we've got left. There's too many important games. Maybe Bournemouth at home, but that might be too of an important game to, to risk any rotation in. Between now and the end of the season, it's near impossible to see where Vieira is going to get some much-needed minutes. I don't see where they're going to come from. Uh, Maximus says, Hi, Tom. Saka got injured in the build-up to Kai's goal and got taken off instantly. He was limping at the time, too. Any update you may have on the injury, hoping he's available for the buying game? I, I don't think it's... From from the sounds of things, I think it was just precaution that he came off. I don't think there's any uh, any worries there, really. I could be wrong. Um, and Arteta said he's fine afterwards. But he has said that before, and then he's not played. So he says that a lot. But he said he's fine, um, which he might just be saying for the cameras, for buying. But I'd take it at face value if I were you. Uh, Benny says, Tom, is enough credit given to Arteta about the profiles that he signed? None of them seem to get injured. Um, Tommy Asu gets injured a lot. Partey gets injured a lot. Zinni gets injured a lot. Uh, <laughs> so that's quite a few. Who are anyone else who's quite injury prone that we signed? Not really. I suppose that's really only three. It's probably some I'm forgetting. Um, most, most though, are quite reliable. Rice, very reliable. Erdegaard, very reliable. Jesus gets injured a lot. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, ben White doesn't get injured. Gabriel doesn't really get injured. Raya and Ramsdale haven't got injured. They are goalkeepers. But, you know, Edison and Allison are both out at the moment. Um, Vieira does get injured quite a bit, to be fair. T Timber's really harsh. <laughs> Timber was a big knee injury. You can't help that. Um, but uh, yeah, Timbo, Timbo, very, very harsh indeed. But I, I guess it's a bit split. I wouldn't turn around and say, Benny, that it's like a, a one that's glaringly obvious, is it? Um, that he's that he's great. So I, 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 I signing players don't get injured. I, I don't think I'd say that at the moment. I think there are too many examples 
in the other direction. Uh, Tony says, even though Villa came back for a draw, it's because the Brentford keeper was diabolical. I think Arsenal will do a similar job as we did to Brighton. I'm very confident going into that Villa game, far more confident than I was going Villa Park. To be honest, the game at Villa Park was an absolute farce. We should have had a penalty. The goal that's ruled out at the end is because of a stupid rule. Um, it's not how it wasn't handball in the in the real world of football, but in the rules that it, it is. Arsenal should have. We had loads of chances against Villa as well in that home game. They were lauded for that win over Arsenal. They played amazing against Man City. They didn't play like that against us. We were by far a better team in that game for me, and we should have won that game. We should have taken the chances, and we should have been getting better decisions in that game that we didn't get. So I will be absolutely looking at Arsenal to take revenge on Villa this uh next weekend um and then look forward to it um let's go to boom 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 uh john says the worst part of the title race is it's out of our hands and if we win all of our games liverpool win all their games it's it's still theirs that is the reality jonathan yeah um but but that is that is the reality of things really i can't there's not too much to comment about that obviously there's been games where like the, the fulham game the west ham game the Aston Villa game, as I've just mentioned, there's games where we've dropped points and it sucks that we drop points. Um, but we, I think that what we'll do is we'll look back at that Fulham game, we'll look back at the West Ham game, and yes, I think some people will try to use those as to undermine Arsenal's season, but I think we needed to have those defeats. In some ways, I think they were necessary because maybe if we didn't have those games where Kivior started at left back and was poor, wasn't that good, even though he was the one that was being asked to invert. Maybe Arteta then never inverts Ben White. He clearly learned from that Fulham game what we needed to do if we were starting Kivior and Ben White. And that has been a foundation of 2024. So I think in some ways we needed that game. Arteta needed that fixture to learn some th certain things, to learn some lessons, and the team needed it as a bit of a wake-up call perhaps as well. Because we've not looked back in 2024. We've just not looked back. Liverpool were really fortunate they played us at that point in time when we lost to them in the FA Cup. And they were very lucky not to get knocked out of the FA Cup in that game. We were better than them in the, in the first half and we should have scored a few goals. Havertz could have scored. Odegaard, if he'd have played a better ball to Havertz, would have been one-on-one -on, -one on goal. And I think there was a point where, was it Nketiah should have crossed or Saka should have crossed to, to Havertz in the second half and didn't. You know, we, we were the better team in Liverpool in that game and they, you know, took their chances at the end. They're very fortunate they played us in the moment that they did in the FA Cup. And we continue to get big teams in those draws in the early rounds of those competitions. But I'm very, very happy with, with how the season is, with how the season's gone. And even though it's out of our hands with eight games to go, I think that we've still got a great chance. But I think we probably will have to win the rest of our games to win the league. But that's usually what teams have to do. If you think about it, when City drew against Forest and we beat Villa to, you know, got quite a few points clear of them at that point, City then won every single game to win the to win the league. And they did that. And they won it because they did that. Now for Arsenal, if we were to win every single game, I think isn't didn't don't you guys tell me that the winning run record is 15 Premier League wins in a row? Is that the most wins of any team has ever managed? I don't know what we're currently on. We should probably have a quick check in terms of, I think we're on, maybe we're on like 12 or so. And so it's one, two, uh, oh, to be fair, we drew against City. So we didn't, <laughs> we haven't got a winning run at all. Um, but I know that a fair few of you were saying that like we have, I think it was, I think the winning run is something ridiculous um, that we would have had to kind of match or break. Um, but uh, we're unbeaten, of course, in 2024 in the league. Liverpool won 24 games in a row. Yeah, absolutely mad. Uh, we are on one. <laughs> We're on two now. We're on two. We got two in a row. We don't forget about the Luton game. So if we have to win every single game between now and the end of the season, it means going on a winning run of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine games. A nine-game winning run. We've done that loads of times. We've done that loads. We've won nine games in a row. We can do that. We can absolutely do that. <laughs> so... <laughs> Hopefully, uh, that will be the case. Um, but uh, it's going to be tough. It's going to be very, 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 very tough. Um, and I can't wait to see what we do. We are going to bring the show to a close there. There is over 1,500 of you watching across YouTube and Twitter. Thank you so much. If you are watching on Twitter, make sure you always hop over to YouTube because uh, you can join in with the chat box and ask the questions that you want to ask if you're over on YouTube. And if you are here on YouTube watching us very dedicatedly and, and nicely, do drop a like on the video. If you're listening on Catch Up on our audio platforms, we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Do hop over to YouTube, though, as well, and drop a like on the video, helping us to reach 1K every single day. But if you are an audio listener and you're listening on iTunes, for instance, if you want to leave a written review, 
that'd be really nice. And if you listen on Spotify, you can also leave five stars if you haven't rated us already. So please do that. It really does help out the channel. We've had some five-star performances. So if you could drop some five-star feedback, I'd really appreciate that. It's been an incredibly frustrating week of technical technological problems. It's a tough word to say, isn't it? Technological. Um, but we've had a lot of these technology problems this week and uh, I've worked really hard to try and sort them out for you. And I'm hoping that everything is coming through crystal clear and nicely every single morning. Um, enjoy your Sunday, people. You've got until 3.30 until your panic sets in and the Liverpool Man United game starts. So you've got a few hours to chill, relax, maybe get out on the golf course or go for a walk or something. Get outside, you know, touch some grass, as they say. But thank you so much for listening. Do drop a like, subscribe, all that usual youtube -y stuff. And I'll be back with you tomorrow morning, bright and early at 8am, to react to the game between Liverpool and Manchester City and just to see where we are. Um, Stay safe, stay well, stay happy and respectful. And uh, as I end the show, yesterday, as you may have saw on Twitter, last year, I sadly lost my granddad. And uh, he was somebody that I was very, very close to. And uh, he died at the age of 99. And yesterday would have been his 100th birthday. And there was just something about that performance yesterday. And I just thought, he's going to be buzzing that they got that win. And I'm hoping that we can get the title home this season for him as well. It'll be very, very, very emotional indeed if that happens. So keep the fingers crossed for me, as I'm sure he is as well. Thank you for listening and see you soon. And as always, up the Arsenal. <laughs>